Uh, thanks, Sridham, and thanks, uh, organizers, uh, for two things. One is, of course, is a great uh, opp opportunity to talk about my work among such a diverse audience. Uh, but secondly, it's a great pleasure to be talking to both Krish and Chandan, who are um, who uh, not only are fantastic scientists uh, and set a very high standard of science, but they've also generated a, and mentored a whole set of students, and you see that uh, reflected in the hall. So thank you very much. Uh, so I'll be talking about biology, so it's very di different from uh, what we talked so far. But it has uh, some uh, connections with what Bulbul talked about. So I'll try and connect between the two interests of Krishnamurthy and uh, Chandan. Okay, so I'll be talking, so I'll be talking about, about development and the story of development uh, of an organism starts with uh, a single cell which is fertilized goes on to make two cells, four cells, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, you see the emergence of an organism. And uh, this, uh, if I can play this movie. I guess I'll have to go there. Okay, so uh, what you see here are labeled nuclei within an embryo of a fruit fly. And you see that there are concerted motion shape changes of cells, movement of cells, et cetera, et cetera. And this is, and finally, it, what you find is that lava will suddenly move out of the range of the, uh, out of the field of view of the microscope. Um, this, this thing happens, this, all this orchestration happens over this time scale of around 24 to 48 hours, depending on the organism. And uh, this is uh, what I'll talk about. The work uh, is a collaboration between theory and experimental group. Dave Shankar Banerjee, who's in the audience, uh, is a student from RRI and, and at NCBS. And we collaborate very closely with uh, Thomas Lekwi and his student, Kangshi Munjil, who from Marseille uh, uh, in France. Uh, Thomas, of course, is a very well-known developmental biologist. Uh, what you see here on the right side is a picture of the system we're looking at. Okay. This is the embryo of a Drosophila. And we'll be studying, and this, this is actually a two-dimensional collection of cells, okay, closed collection of cells. It encloses a fluid called the yolk, and this two-dimensional collection of cells under, undergoes remodeling because of individual cells change the shape and move the structures with each other. So what causes the changes in shape and movement of cells with respect to each other are forces, and the forces are generated in each and every individual cell. And this is what we are trying to understand. What is the dynamics? Uh, what is the origin of these forces? And how does that give rise to changes in shape and changes in movements of cells with respect to each other? Okay, so what I'm showing here are three different stages of the uh, Drosophila or fruit fly embryo. Uh, they're given different names. One is called mesodermal invagination, germ bed extension, and dorsal closure. They're at three different time states of this developing embryo. And I'll just play the movie here which shows you different kinds of cell shape changes. Okay. You'll, see, you'll see that in one case, shape changes on the, so what you're seeing is the tissue on, uh, on, on that side. Okay. So each of these are individual cells, which uh, are distributed, polygons which are distributed on a two-dimensional surface. And what we found there was that this surface of this constricts and then undergoes an invagination. This is called a mesodermal invagination. Whereas here, the, uh, the cells uh, get, uh, change the shape and move relative to each other. You can see a movement. Okay. This is the stage we'll be looking at in closer detail, the germ band extension. Okay, so, 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 so that's the picture. You have a two-dimensional closed surface of cells, and uh, there are objects within each cell which, and, which give rise to shape changes of cells and movement of cells with respect to each other. What gives rise to forces within each cell are these force generators. Okay? These are active force generators. They, are, uh, they primarily consist of these two sets of molecules, actin, which are rigid filaments, and myosin motors, which by the hydrolysis of ATP generate stresses locally. Okay? So myosin uh, comes together to form these mini filaments. They bind to actin. Upon ATP hydrolysis, they apply contractile forces, so they tug onto the actin. So here is a picture of a collection of filaments 
that you'll see in every cell of this tissue. And embedded on that are myosin mini filaments, collections of myosin motors, and they will apply such forces to this tissue. Okay. So this is the origin, the, the molecular origin of, for, of uh, forces in biology. And uh, you'll see that uh, I'm now going to play again two movies here. Uh, so these movies don't play, but what you'll see is that the cells both here and in this system uh, have this green color, namely actin and myosin. Okay? And bo both these things apply forces on the cell, but their eventual phenotype or the eventual um, behavior of the cells is to do this kind of junctional shrinkage. So these four cells come to get this junction shrinks, and then these two cells, which are initially ne nearest neighbors, they go apart. This is what happens in germ band extension, and this is what happens in mesodermal invagination. The same actin and myosin gives rise to, instead of junction shrinkage, gives rise to an area shrinkage, and that gives rise to uh, invagination of the, of the membrane. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that this is the same actomyosin host generators that exist in every cell of the embryo, but at different stages, this, uh, these host generators give rise to different kind of phenotypes. Uh, and this is a big puzzle and a big challenge to biologists to understand. How is this happening? Okay, so this is what we'll do is we'll focus on on uh, this uh, particular uh, part, the mesodermal invagination. Uh, sorry, the uh, the germ band extension, and okay. and I'm going to uh, outline here that the talk. So again, what you're seeing here is actomyosin and in individual cells. All these are different cells, and you found that they, you know, ro they form clustered, they coalesce, and they move and generate changes in the shape of the of these cells. Okay. So what we'll be talking about here is the dynamics of actomyosin. It's nucleation, coalescence, pulsation, and flow in each and cell. Uh, to understand this, I'll describe an active elastomer theory, an active elastomer with turnover of its components, namely actin and myosin. And I'll discuss whether such a system should be viewed as a fluid or an elastic system. Uh, having done this, I'll try and describe a hydrodynamic description of an affine elastomer okay, and uh, do some theoretical analysis. Finally, I'll show that this hydrodynamic description of an affine elastomer gives rise to traveling pulse solutions. Uh, and then I'll show that for high act uh, actomyosin contractility, when the local density of myosin becomes very high, the meshwork of actin rips apart giving rise to very significant turnover and non-affine uh, distortions of the elastomer. And I'll show that this is a really interesting material property of the, of the system and very, very ubiquitous in cells. And this typically occurs at very high uh, density of mass. Okay, so what's, what's important to uh, uh, realize here is that uh, in these pictures that I showed you, which I'm going to play again, there are uh, a set of time scales involved okay? and a whole range of time scales. And you see action happening at from the smallest times to the large, larger times. Uh, so, for instance, you find so what you're labeling, we're looking at here is myosin, and okay? you find that there's nucleation of myosin at uh, at a time scale of around five seconds, which then coalesce and form these little spindles, which then pulsate and move over this time scale. And uh, what uh, uh, we would like to argue is that while at the very largest time scale, it's, it's appropriate to view the actomyosin uh, system in each cell as a fluid, at shorter time scales, uh, the elastic properties are important. So if you want to describe the, the, the dynamics over this entire set of time scales, then I should have a theory of elasticity which smoothly goes over to a theory of and uh, uh, this has been, uh, is a challenge, and I'd like to discuss some of uh, our understanding of this, of this process. Okay. So here are the minimal uh, ingredients uh, which has come from uh, a variety of experiments. What you're seeing here is this two-dimensional surface, two-dimensional sheet of cells, and you're looking at this, at the face, this face of the, of the cell, okay? And in each cell, depicted here, you have actin filaments and myosin, which can be either bound or unbound to the actin. Okay? 
So think of this as a, as a charpai, you know, uh, a, a roof bed, okay, where the actin filaments form these ropes. Uh, and myosin locally comes onto these rope beds and then squeezes, okay, applies contratile forces and squeezes. Now, it's not like a traditional rope bed because there's also turnover. So you can imagine that the myosin unbinds and binds onto this, but the actin also unbinds and binds. Okay, the ropes sort of <laughs> give in and, you know, unbind from this charpai and then and come back. So that's the description that we'd like to talk about. So clearly, at very sh uh, at time scales shorter than the actin binding and unbinding, the connectivity is maintained, and I should be able to view it as an elastomer. Okay. Okay. So now the question is that: Is this actin myosin meshwork to be treated as an elastic meshwork or a fluid? Uh, and uh, this, this forms part of our arguments about why we think at short time scales you should view it as, a, as an elastic meshwork. And this, and this is the following. Uh, re remember, as you see in this picture, uh, as, the actin, uh, as the myosin pulsates, the area changes. Okay? So the area is the response to the force generators of, of myosin. Okay? So I can view the myosin as being the forces which give rise to a response, namely the area shrinkage of each cell. And if I now measure, uh, if I look, look at the time series of the area, which is in green, okay, and uh, in blue is the time series of the, of the myosin, you'll find that they are largely in phase. Okay? This, sorry? No, they look out of phase because it should be minus it's 180 degrees out of this. <laughs> okay, so what you should be looking at is minus A because it's shrinking. <laughs> uh, so if you, if you calculate, for instance, G prime, so this is for the dorsal closure, one instance of, of what happens in tissue. This is for the germ band extension. What you find is that G prime, at the frequency of oscillation of the myosin, G prime is larger than G. Of the, right, the, no, uh, right, concentration integrated over the entire set. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what happens if that also shrinks? Uh, that's uh, dictated by other, uh, right. So there's a, there is a set of myosins which sits at the periphery, and the dynamics of shrinkage, actually that's an interesting <laughs> question. Okay, so let me just... Uh, Okay, I wasn't going to talk about it here, but what happens is that uh, when myosin sort of pulsates and goes, you know, goes up and down, after some time it flows, and then it flows to either this junction or that junction. When it flows to this junction, the length of the junction shrinks. Okay? So the shrinkage of the junction is a much larger, longer time scale, around 120 seconds, compared to the... There's, um, meaning, yeah, yeah, the separate variable. Uh, so the other uh, other arguments are that you know each uh, this actin in each cell is actually held tightly to the edges, okay, by molecules. So if you get rid of these molecules, the whole uh, you don't see this pulsation. Okay, so the fact that it's tied to the edges of the bed, the ropes are tied to the edges of the bed, are responsible for the pulsation. Okay, so this is, these are some of the reasons why we think at uh, low time scales of the order of 50 seconds, one should be thinking of this as an uh, elastomer and not a fluid. Uh, okay, so this is the theory of an active elastomer. Uh, there have been other people who have worked on this in the field and list them here. Now, the only thing that you need to, uh, I mean, the, the difference here is that the elastomer is constantly remodeled. Okay? Both actin and myosin filaments bind and unbind onto this pressure. So here in this overdamped limit, I'm going to take this as the equation. The local mesh velocity is proportional to the force, and the forces are a sum of the elastic force, okay, the active forces, and the dissipative. Okay? Uh, the myosin uh, ha is affected by the local, so the bound myosin is affected by the local meshwork. It also diffuses, and uh, it binds and unbinds. Okay? And we'll, what we'll take is that uh, when there is a larger local strain, there is a larger unbinding of myosin. 
So there's a strain dependent bias in turn. This seems to be necessitated by, by, by the experiments. The third is that the actin is again locally advected by the meshwork itself and has a permeation and a turnover. At the moment, we'll, let's focus on an affine theory where we sort of drop this term and say that the changes in local myosin, uh, local actin density are slave to expression. Okay? So we won't, we won't have any, so the dynamics of actin is very, very fast. Okay? It's a slave. Uh, the thing to note is that the uh, typical uh, profile or form of uh, active stresses as a function of myosin density is that it increases linearly with myosin density, more myosin, more stresses, but later on it saturates. Okay? So we'll take an appropriate form to describe that. Okay, so that's the picture. You have uh, the meshwork, you have myosin, binds and unbinds, and it binds it locally compresses uh, the mesh. And the unbinding is a strain dependent of Okay, so, so we can do the standard things, do linear stability theory, then put in non-linearities, and this is what I'm going to go through. Uh, the, I won't go through the, the equations, but just I want to show you a phase diagram here. So the linear stability phase diagram is that if you plot the elastic stress versus the active stresses, then clearly, for, if the elastic stress is very large, that is the tarpai or the ropes are very st uh, rigid, then it's not going to be... Uh, be affected by the bound myosin. Okay. So you get a stable configuration for high elastic stress. When the active contractor stresses are very high, then the myosin binds on it and can totally lead to a contractile instability. Okay. And so in these two ends, it's easy to understand what happens. Contractile instability here, stable solutions here. In the middle, when the elastic stress is comparable to the active stresses, you get oscillations. Okay. So it binds Boing, boing, boing. Okay. And uh, however, in this linear theory, of course, the amplitude of the oscillations is unbounded, and that's cured by adding nonlinearities, which I'll go to next. Okay. So this is what happens in a fully nonlinear description. That is, you take those equations that I showed you earlier and uh, solve them numerically. Uh, this is what Dave Shankar had done. And this is the phase diagram that you get. Okay. Again, the elastic stress versus the active stress. And you get the same stable configuration for high uh, elastic stress shown by a chymograph phase time plot of the local density of myosin. Okay. For uh, high active stresses, you again get this good contractile collapse. But, and in the middle, you get a phase which is oscillation. Okay. When, the, when, the, when the elastic stress is comparable to the active stress. However, the fully nonlinear uh, theory also gives, it, uh, gives rise to a surprise that there's an additional phase here which corresponds to a moving phase. There's a region here in the phase diagram where the chymographs show this kind of picture. You can see that they, are, they have a non-zero slope. So the density of myosin moves as, uh, as, uh, as the time progresses. Okay. So how do you understand this? How do you understand this emergence of a new traveling solution? Yeah? And the way to understand it is following. If you unpack the various nonlinearities that go into, the, into that uh, equation, uh, this is what you, you find, that the active stress, for instance, remember, was a function both of actin density and myosin density. And if, yes, if you allow me to sort of split up the contribution of act, actin and myosin density like so, okay, then this is, this, is the, this is the thing which rises linearly in, in the myosin density and then saturates. For this, I'll sort of expand about the uniform uh, density of act. Okay? And since we have already set in this affine theory, we have already set the local variations of actin density to be proportional to the compression, this will involve terms, uh, involve terms having uh, you know, compression. Okay? So when you, when you expand this and pull it back into the equations of motion and collect all this strain dependent terms here and all the non, all terms which don't depend on strain here, then you get the following set of equations. You find that the local mesh velocity looks like this, is the gradient of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, a force. Okay? And there's, a, an, there's an active piece here, which depends only on rho b and not on the strain. Okay? And the form is given there. And in addition, that's coupled to a local myosin density, which has the usual advection, diffusion, and turnover. The form of this, this force here is, is uh, interesting. And... Uh, and this is what you find. Okay. 
find that for low myosin density, the form is quadratic, linear elasticity theory. As you increase the myosin density, this renormalizes the potential here to give rise to the secondary minimum. Okay. Um, and it's and the reason and so and so what you get once you start having more myosin bound myosin and the emergence of the secondary minima, you find this kind of traveling wave solution, okay? a traveling pulse solution. Okay? It moves with, and doesn't change the shape as a function of time. And uh, that's so numerically, this is the, how the shape goes. Yeah. There is the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that uh, I didn't draw it properly. <laughs> yeah, there is a barrier. So it's uh, so. What happens is that you can, uh, you know, you can. The way to understand this, this is very similar to something called a generalized Fitzsimons-Nagoma equation, where you have two variables, uh, v and w. One is fast compared to the other, and the solutions are basically hug the null clines of these things. Okay, and this is exactly what happens here. Huh? The null clines are basically given by the uh, by this minima of this potential. And so what happens is that far away in space, x equals plus infinity, x equals minus infinity, you're sitting at that minima. And in between, you, you go there and come back. Okay? So x equals plus infinity, you're here. You go towards the origin, let's say. You jump to that solution. And then you very quickly go there as you approach x equals minus infinity. Okay? So that's the traveling. So this is the classic uh, solution of the generalized fitzgerald nagomo equations which can be applied to our system here. Okay, so now if we sort of, uh, we try to compare our theory results to experiments, uh, this is at the early times that I talked about, where we feel that theory is, is valid. And these are chymographs of how space-time plots, okay, theory experiment of myosin density. And you can see that there is the nucleation of myosin, okay, then coalescence, as you see here, experiment and theory. And once it attains a certain size, then you see that it has a non-zero slope and therefore moves. Okay. So you start seeing that beyond a certain uh, threshold, it starts moving. Okay. And this is the, the shape while it moves. Once it moves, it's, it's attained this kind of shape. Okay. Just prior to the onset of move, movement, the myosin pulse has, has a symmetric shape. So this is from theory, this is from experiment. We looked at these myosin speckles and analyzed the profile, and you find that on the onset of movement, it has this kind of asymmetry. skip this. Uh, okay, so now what I've talked so far is, is an affine theory where the meshwork connectivity is intact. Uh, however, this and, and the, what moves is actually a moving deformation. Okay? It's not that the material moves along. Uh, how far is this theory valid? And uh, what we believe is that uh, it, it uh, and remember, this happens in the flowing solution, OK? Yeah. So, so as time progresses, you're going to collect more and more myosin locally. And beyond a certain uh, conductility of myosin, uh, the, the network will start rupturing. Okay? So you can no longer use this, this kind of analysis. So uh, we, start, we looked at some uh, 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 data which tells you how the, how the turnover or Unbinding of actin depends on local myosin contractility. Okay, and what we and from the scarce data that is available, you find that the time scale of uh, unbinding of my of actin, okay, the meshwork of actin increases slightly as you increase myosin contractility, but beyond a certain point, it plummets down okay, and goes to a very low value. So if so, we don't know where this this uh, catastrophic jump uh, or uh, uh, Jump happens, uh, but you can imagine that when you're at time scales smaller than this jump, then you, you can use an affine theory. However, at these time scales, you can no longer use an affine theory. Okay, the actin turnover is significant and affects mesh connectivity. So there should be a, a, a crossover from an affine elastomer with turnover to a non-affine elastomer, and the and the challenge here is to try to see if one can understand the dynamics of this non-affine elastomer. 
Okay, so uh, here's some attempts that we, this is uh, inspired by some uh, fantastic work by Tanaka and Edwards in the physics of, phys of uh, physical gels, uh, where you try to describe a theory where, uh, so it's, uh, it's a theory which is kind of a mean field theory which removes all space description. Uh, and what you, you what you try to show is that you you define something called n of epsilon t, which is the probability density of elastically coupled filaments of strain epsilon at time t. Okay? Uh, and then, as Myosin uh, applies forces, there's going to be uh, you know this, uh, the num so certain filaments will unbind, certain filaments will bind. If so, basically n sub e n of epsilon t will have a, uh, a term which reduces n locally and term which increases n locally. The term which reduces n locally will come from unbinding and from stiffening, whereas the term that increases n locally will come from binding. Okay. So one can write down equations like this, like gain and loss terms, for the local number of uh, filaments, elastically coupled filaments. It has uh, this time dependence plus an attraction term in epsilon space, binding and unbinding. And this kind of theory shows that for large uh, unbinding, uh, this network can fluidize. Okay. The simple model will just give you a Maxwell model for fluidization with the viscosity proportional to the rate of, un of uh, unbinding. Okay. However, uh, this theory is wanting in the sense that it's, it throws away space altogether. Uh, there's been some very interesting work, numerical work recently by Ed Munro's group and Roger Camp's group, which takes uh, actin myosin with turnover and subjects it to macroscopic stresses. And ask how does the stress, how does it, this respond to stress? For instance, Ed Munro shows that the local stresses, okay, now what's that? Yeah, I can't read it. But basically, uh, basically it, it, it looks like a, like an elastic solid for small applied stress, but beyond a certain uh, critical load, it sort of ruptures and fluidizes. Okay. And you find that this, that this sigma x, I think this is the, I think this is the, the stress is internal to the system and this is the applied stress. Okay. That is independent of the applied stress. In Roger Cam's work, he shows that if you have unbinding of actin, but no rebinding, then the actin slowly forms these fragmented structures. The moment you turn on rebinding of actin, then you can get a connected mesh. Okay. So I think the rheology of this system would be fantastic to study, and this has not been studied so far. Uh, and the other thing to study would be to uh, write down a hydrodynamic description for this kind of uh, system. Uh, so we, ha we made some attempts at doing that to try to think of it as a two fluid model where you, you say that the volume fraction of moving so of dense connected clusters is phi, and the volume fraction, sorry, this is the one minus phi is the dense connected cluster, and this is the, uh, is the fluid cluster. And uh, we tried some hokey theory, which I don't really like. Uh, but what we really need is to have a theory which will, uh, which will be a hydrodynamic theory for actin and myosin, which undergoes rapid turnover. And uh, that's, uh, it's like ripping and reforming the meshwork. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. So, so, this, so at late times, we, we sort of feel that the moving cluster is really a result of this transient, uh, uh, you know, connected, disconnected network, which gives rise to this moving object. Okay. And this is, uh, there's some preliminary data from Thomas Lekby's group I won't go through the detail because uh, it's, well, this thing is called, it's called FRAT, fluorescence resonance out, out of uh, photo bleaching, but I won't try to describe this thing. But this sort of is consistent with the fact that what moves is not a deformation, but an actin myosin cluster. Um, so it seems to me that when it's, when the, it's crucial to understand the, uh, the physics, of this constantly ripping and reforming actin, uh, actin uh, So. I will also time, okay. 15 minutes? <laughs> okay, uh, well, I, 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 can, I can skip it then. So, okay, so, so in future, um, these, these are the future directions that we uh, like to take. 
uh, one, yeah. One is that we are currently doing an analytical study of these traveling front solutions, uh, uh, very akin to what uh, has been done in the Fitsunagumo model. Uh, Dev Shankar is now trying to, with uh, Vijay, is trying to work on the 2D numerics of this uh, system of equations. Uh, there are a lot of things in small print which I won't go through, but it's related to correlations of actin and myosin in, in different cells of the same tissue. Uh, there's a recent work. Uh, ongoing work with Richard Morris, who's a postdoc at uh, uh, at, uh, at NCBS, uh, on something called posterior midcut invagination, which is taking this elastomer and putting it on a curved manifold, uh, and that has consequences in a later stage of the development of the embryo. But what's what I wanted to draw your attention to is this uh, uh, is currently a numerical study of the rheology and strain fluctuations of an active elastomer the turnover, both of actin and myosin, and the unbinding and rebinding uh, in, in, in situations where the unbinding and rebinding of uh, actin depends on the strain, where some signaling uh, captures. The reason why this is interesting is that actin and myosin, when reconstituted outside in, in, in vitro, never shows the dramatic fluctuations that you see in vivo. So there's something happening in vivo which we don't understand, that, uh, and this is, like to, this, I, this is something I'd like to understand. So, I'll end my talk with just this statement here that uh, I uh, that uh, that this particular direction. I mean, first of all, thank you all of you, and a warm thanks to Krishan and Chandan. Uh, and I was I just put this up because I, as a as an invitation uh, to uh, Krish uh, that this would be an interesting physics problem to study, and uh, I'd like to get some uh, you know discuss with him and other people in, in, uh, in ISC about how to go about doing a hydrodynamic theory for systems with very large turnover. So with that, I'll do the end of the talk. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so basically, okay. so the binding unbinding is something that you're now adding to the Tanaka Edwards. Yeah, I put that, yeah. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's then. Right. And it's an active binding unbinding, so it's so Tanaka Edwards. So is there have, another? Yeah, there's another equation for okay. rope. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Right. Uh, so the question is, uh, you, you know, the main challenge, I think, uh, is uh, to construct a hydrodynamic theory with the rapid turnover. Yeah. But then the time scales, which would be large compared to the turnover time scale, is large compared to certain other time scales based on which um, you would go and construct the hydrodynamic theory. So you showed that uh, there was a sort of a plethora of time scales, right. and I was wondering what, what that is. Because it, so, of course, at the very longest time scale, that a time scale is much larger than actin turnover, uh, appropriate description would be that of a fluid. Uh, but if you want to have a description right from the early time scales to the later, uh, then you, I think it's necessary to go through this uh, way of thinking. Uh, because um, it's not clear to me that, I mean, in fact, uh, I mean, simulations by Ed Munro and other people show that this, that the fluid that you get by constant unbinding and rebinding is really not a Maxwell fluid. Okay. And there's some recent beautiful experiments by, uh, by Christoph Schmidt where they try to take an intact actomyosin network from, from frog's egg and they show very dramatic fluctuations. Okay. So if the if the unbinding binding statistics was purely exponential, then of course you'll get maximum description. But in this case, there could be some very correlated binding. You know, that is, imagine locally actin sort of ripped apart. Then it, this could activate a rock signaling pathway, which can then you know, start polymerizing and attaching actin 
uh, onto the measure. So this kind of correlated uh, statistics of binding and unbinding would be very interesting. You can um, basically reproduce qualitatively this traveling wave phenomenon. The parameters that you get out from your model, can you do independent experiments to show that right. there are not phony values or not, uh, right. how realistic is this? Right. How is so not yet because uh, we can get some values but not too many. Uh, so one of the things that we can sort of predict is that the, uh, the dependence of the force uh, so the intensity of myosin on the, on the velocity. So we can get the proportionality constant associated with that. But not too many because, uh, uh, you know, so there have been such attempts of, you know, going back to experiments uh, and then using theory to fix certain parameters. But these have typically been done in very large systems. That is, large embryos in the single cell stage. So C. elegans, for example, Vijay is one of the people who has done that. Uh, that. That scale at which you're, you're doing the experiment is much larger than this. Each cell is here is around 10 microns, here, or 20 microns, and that's the, that's the scale that you, you have. With. So it's, uh, it's been difficult to do precise experiments to go back and then, and then get, but there's some parameters that we have. But this is, this is the direction that we need to be going. Well, just, uh, something I missed, you had an actin mesh work that was being distorted by yeah. On, by myosin contractility and the motors were coming on and off. Yeah, yeah. But there wasn't any polymerization of actin, was there? Or, uh, that? Not, no, there was no pol polymerization. Yeah. So in this, so the turnover here could be either due to uh, polymerization, deep polymerization, depolymerization of actin, or it could be because of filaments themselves, you know, unbinding and, uh, uh, or, you know, uh, filaments being cut. Uh, there are the, all these molecules like copilin. So the, the, the nature of the unbinding is still unclear. What exactly, you know, which con what contribution comes from depolymerization, what comes from severing, what comes from uh, Sure, but I don't think actin polymerization itself is, uh, is yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, yeah. But you're right, there's no actin polymerization. Is it uh, because I have to... yeah. uh, Is it only actin and myosin which are the players, or there are other things like uh, this thing called Merlin or Merlin? No. <laughs> so there are other proteins which. Uh... Merlin. So... Oh, I see. Ha. Huh. Uh, no. So uh, yeah, but the molasses protein is uh, a yeah, yeah. protein which uh, yeah, but that's a different context. So that, that does not play around. Uh, what's, the other player is cadherin. That is these molecules which hold actin onto the edges. That's an important player. Uh, but that we just taken as, you know, uh, giving, giving rise to boundary conditions. But you're right that the dynamics of th those molecules can couple to the dynamics here, and that would be right. Yeah, for this serve, uh, yeah. That's right, that's right. That's right. That's right. Right, exactly. So the next step of what Dev Shankar has been doing is to try to see whether these actomycin pulses and floats correlate between cells and how do they how do they correlate? Uh, Richard is looking at the uh, at a later stage where the whole cell uh, the tissue flows and and curves. Yeah. So we are doing that. Yeah. So the, yeah. So another big. Uh, question is how do you go from the microscopic scale, that is cellular scale, to the tissue scale? And so another ongoing uh, work that a lot of people are doing. Uh, these uh, mycenes, uh, are you taking the effect of, uh, I mean, this unbinding would also depend on the stresses, uh, right. particular motor is? Yes, yes. In, Right. So, are you taking that? Effect? Right. So, we have a strain-dependent unbinding. Is it fixed? Right. So there is a strain-dependent unbinding. Okay. And the velocities of yeah. uh, these motors yeah. also depend on ATP yeah. concentration. So, the velocity of each motor depends on ATP concentration. ATP concentration. Yeah, assuming also. that the ATP concentration is fixed here, and that's a valid assumption. Okay. So, I mean, uh, but I mean, 
molecular motors, I mean, it yeah. could show uh, it could show some saturating behavior. Right. That's true. It's meant That's true. Kind of yeah, kinetics. Yeah. Yeah. So, so no one has done that experiment about using flushing the system with ATP and okay. looking at how this uh, con whether the contractility the pulsation would cease or not. Right. Mm -hmm. This would be an interesting. But you remember, this is all in an egg. It's all yeah. it's different from single cell manipulation. So these these are much more different. Yeah. Huh? Oh, it's on. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, but okay. So, no, no. I I, just, I couldn't tell in this picture where you've broken detail balance. This looks like. So, uh, are you going to put in some funny relation right, between the right, exactly. Ks? Finding, so the, the Kb by Ku yeah. has a certain, uh, so the ratio doesn't, is not e to the power of. So what, e to the power of what should it be if it's equilibrium? Um, that, that energy of the, the energy difference, I see. But uh, you, you actually looked at what happens when they're, at the difference in behavior when they are in detailed balance versus when they're not? We no, no. Yeah. That would be an Yeah. Okay, so if there's no further questions, uh, let's uh, thank Madan and, and both the speakers of the session.